those things where you know, like you get some kind of emotion that we run through. I guess you could be like a chancellor. Okay, I think it's uh, time to start. Uh, thank you for making uh, the colloquium this week. I know this is a strange day, usually it's a Monday, so that's uh, the end of the week instead of the beginning of the week. Uh, so it's uh, my real pleasure to have uh, here uh, Dr. Concetta Fazio. Uh, she's the head of the Nuclear Fuel Safety Unit of the European Commission at the GRC. She has a very long CV, but uh, <laughs> since you want to hear from her and not from me, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it here. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Toto Fazio. Thank you. Thank you, Max, and I'm really happy to be here and uh, it will be a seminar maybe quite unusual for you because I will talk about uh, Europe and I will enter into some uh, details which are not uh, too much uh, scientific or technological, it's just details about Europe and the Joint uh, Research Center. And uh, you see the title is Nuclear Energy Challenges in Europe, so this is the first uh, uh, focus that I will have and the second will be on uh, the transportation of uh, nuclear fuel. And here is the outline, so I will uh, uh, start just to show you sh uh, some uh, uh, slides on, um, uh, sorry, some data on nuclear energy in Europe compared then with other world regions. Uh, I will enter and give you details where I am coming from. So I, I will give you really details of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And then uh, some uh, items and challenges uh, concerning the transportation and nuclear fuel cycle. And here I will focus down to the nuclear fuel because uh, that's the area uh, where I, uh, I work nowadays. And nuclear materials in terms of uh, structural materials or planning materials, this was the area where I was, I was working in the past. So you will hear about that. And I'll close with something also very original that we have done uh, in Germany in terms of uh, study of uh, social challenges connected to the transmutation uh, uh, promise and then the conclusion. Now the nuclear energy in Europe is uh, here you see the 2016, well I've taken this from the World Energy Outlook 2017 so it's quite new. And you see here the situation in 2016 was that Europe was really um, somehow leader for what concerns uh, nuclear energy generation. Uh, then is uh, the United States, uh, Japan, China and Russia uh, were following. I would say that uh, in Europe this has been already changed, it's already going down uh, or reducing the amount of uh, gigawatt uh, electric installed uh, in, term, uh, in terms of nuclear energy. And what is the projected situation for 2040 is that uh, the situation will change completely. So China will take over the leadership with really a big amount of uh, uh, nuclear reactor installed in their, en in their electricity grid. And uh, even the United States will have more uh, nuclear elec electricity generated with respect to the European Union. So this is the, uh, the world that we live in Europe with, but uh, this, um, in any case, we still continue to do research work in the area of nuclear safety, and in, the, in particular for the GSC, also in the area of nuclear uh, safeguard and security. Uh, yeah, that's uh, another, just for curiosity, how the nuclear power plants are distributed in Europe. So. Uh, this is Russia, if you, we, we don't consider Russia, then you see that not all European countries uh, have uh, nuclear power plants, and the country that has most is uh, France, I guess you know that. So we have here, and this is from 2000, I guess, uh, I don't know, but this is quite recent, because we have the eight power plants in Germany. So France has 58 uh, uh, power plants, followed by the UK with 15, and then, uh, uh, Spain and Germany and Finland, uh, it's four 
and they are going to build another one. So that's the distribution that we have nowadays and uh, this will be reduced. However, the um, share in terms of electricity generation, it was, this is 2013, but it's, uh, I would say it's still uh, the same share today. is quite high, so we are in the order of 30% uh, of uh, electricity generated. And this makes, you see it here, it makes 50% of CO2-free electricity generated. And uh, that's uh, uh, it's really an issue or a key point that has been even recently discussed. I, I think you have heard of, about the ICCP uh, report that was published and a uh, big discussion on that. So nuclear can uh, indeed contribute uh, to decarbonize uh, the electricity. So, so now the next point, I, as I told you before, I want to present to you also the research center where I work. And this uh, research center oh, sorry, is called the uh, Joint Research Center. And Joint stand, stands for the fact that we work uh, for the European Commission, so we belong to what is called European Commission. You might uh, compare it somehow to the DOE, somehow, but not completely. Um, so meaning we are cross-cutting all member states of, uh, of Europe. And we, we, and I will show you, we, we focus not only on nuclear energy, we focus also on uh, other areas. So how is uh, the Joint Research Center distributed? So we, ha we have uh, institutes in different sites, so in different uh, uh, European uh, member states. And uh, I want to show you just here. So we have one, it's uh, very north in the Netherlands. So here we have the Netherlands. Then we have one in Belgium, uh, in Gael. Then this one in Karlsruhe is where I am. So I'm here uh, living in Germany. And then this one is in Italy, North Italy, called Istra. And we have another center in Sevilla, and this is in Spain. So you see, it's uh, even distributed over Europe. We, ha we are not one campus in one place, so there are several campus in uh, several places, and each campus is addressing uh, different type of topics. And Karlsruhe, in particular, has the topic of uh, nuclear fuel safety and nuclear waste, um, sorry, nuclear fuel safety, nuclear fuel cycle and the waste management. We have some nuclear activities also here in the Netherlands, in Italy and in Gaia. Uh, some numbers for curiosity. So the stuff of uh, GLC you see here, it's uh, 3,000 uh, uh, members or units and we have uh, a budget of about uh, 450 million uh, euro per year. So it's sizable, I would say, it's not so bad. But uh, again, not only on one area, we cover uh, different areas. And the different areas that we cover are, are here summarized. Uh, so it is called growth and innovation. Then we have energy, transport, and climate, sustainable resources, space, security, and migration, health, consumers, and reference materials and the nuclear safety and uh, security area, uh, we call it directorate, and in this directorate I am located. And the directorate looks like that. So uh, it is, uh, uh, it has, so well, let's, let me first present you our director. She is Maria Betti, she is also an Italian like me. Uh, and uh, she is responsible, you see here for uh, three departments, so we have one department on nuclear safety, then one department on nuclear security and safeguards, so I told you before we look also in this area, and uh, one department on nuclear decommissioning, because decommissioning is also an, uh, an item that is very important. We tend to close the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, sorry, uh, we tend to close the nuclear fuel cycle, but we have to also close the nuclear life cycle. So we have to show that we can uh, dismantle a nuclear reactor and eventually go to the green field. Uh, then there are three, we call them uh, three cross-cutting units. So the radiation protection and security unit, this is just to tell you 
practicalities. This is a unit that is very important for running our facility, which is a nuclear facility in Karlsruhe. So we need uh, radiation protection and we need security. Uh, then we have uh, uh, another cross-cutting unit that is uh, doing mainly nuclear data generation. Uh, it is called Standard for Nuclear Safety, Safeguard and Security, and a cross-cutting unit on uh, knowledge management. Uh, inside the nuclear safety department, there are additional units and I'm located here, so I'm not the head of the unit, as Max has said, but I'm the deputy head of the unit. The head is uh, Rudy Konings, and this is the nuclear fuel safety unit. And then maybe just to, to, to show how much stuff is uh, on the different sites, and uh, it's in the order of 500 uh, 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 staff members, and Karlsruhe, so in Germany, it's the biggest uh, uh, institute that uh, works on uh, nuclear. Yeah, the vision and strategy of the directorate is this is uh, relatively new. We uh, have uh, had a reorganization in the GRC in 2016 and we changed also or we updated also our vision and strategy and we tried to connect what are the soci societal challenges uh, with our work program. So you see here, we recognize here. Uh, some challenges that uh, we face in the society, society like uh, protecting the society, sustainability and uh, decarbonization, the reversibility, so what is the connection with the decommissioning and back to the green field, or also broadening knowledge and competences. So this is now the new um, definition of the vision and strategy of the uh, Directorate of Nuclear Fuel Safety and Security. And the related work program is uh, given here, and you see that uh, inside the Directorate we work on safety of current and innovative systems, uh, looking on, uh, I guess you can here recognize very typical uh, topics that are hot, if I can say it like that, uh, nowadays in terms of uh, nuclear reactors like the long-term operations or lifetime extension of nuclear reactors and uh, all the issues that are related to the long-term operation but also the uh, modeling of uh, safety related or CV accidents or transient related issues on a, on a nuclear reactor. Uh, then we have uh, safety of advanced nuclear systems uh, together with uh, innovative fuel cycles and the knowledge for the, um, uh, you know, we use the knowledge to make policy support. In the area of uh, safe security safeguard and non-proliferation, non there are also a number of activities, uh, maybe just to, to show here that we work also on remote safeguards, so to have uh, this uh, accountancy of materials done in a remote way. This would help also in improving the safeguarding of the nuclear material. Then we are in the decommissioning and environmental uh, remediation and the waste management. Here the, we do activities uh, for damaged core. You can imagine damaged core, we're talking about Fukushima. But the lessons learned there, we can imagine to use it also for not damaged core. And of course, we work on all items that are related to the waste management. It means uh, the intermediate storage and then the storage in a geological repository. And uh, finally, the nuclear science applications. Uh, um, I hear basic properties of uh, normally we look on actinides and uh, ac accelerator based uh, uh, nuclear data measurement. Okay, then uh, finally I come down to the unit where I am, uh, the deputy head of unit, just to show you what we do here in this unit. The unit is called nuclear fuel safety, so all what uh, is around the fuel safety is part of our activities, uh, starting from uh, fuel fabrication, the determination of their properties in terms of thermal properties, uh, chemical properties, microstructure, and so on. Then we prepare irradiation and post-irradiation programs. So normally we, the, the fabricated uh, fuel or innovative fuel, we normally irradiate it and then check the properties of the irradiated fuel 
it, and deliver data in order to uh, simulate accidents or also for the fuel performance codes. Uh, the competences and skills available in the unit is really wide ranging with going from material science, physics, nuclear chemistry and nuclear engineering. A uh, couple of pictures of our infrastructure, just to show you how the, uh, what type of ins infrastructure we have in order to work on nuclear fuel. Uh, for the synthesis, uh, for instance, we can use the spark plasma sintering. Uh, this is a quite a flexible tool where one can uh, fabricate different types of, of fuels and tailoring also the composition of the fuel. Uh, thermal diffusivity is done with the laser flash and uh, here we measure also thermal conductivity. Uh, the hot cells are very important uh, for uh, receiving the irradiated fuel and uh, even irradiated fuel pins and then in the hot cells we can uh, uh, out of the fuel pins or pellets, we can then prepare our samples and uh, investigate the samples. The minor actinite laboratory is relevant uh, in the case of, uh, for instance, the transportation studies because uh, we address there the minor actinides. The Knudsen fusion mass spectrometry is very much used, for instance, to measure fission gas release out of the nuclear fuel. And then the microscope, uh, the transmission electron microscope used uh, normally, we have also a scanning electron uh, microscope used for normally doing microstructural analysis of the fuel. So here you see more or less what are our uh, tools that we have available in order to do the fuel characterization. And this is just an example of a, a TM done on um, uranium americium fuel with different uh, percentage of uh, americium and uh, different uh, irradiation levels. Here the levels are really quite low, we are less than one dPa, so it's really nothing. But uh, the idea was to understand if there is uh, any dependence from the content of americium or the dPa level on this uh, dislocation loops that uh, are formed. And you see, you can, we can measure the loops uh, at nanometer level with the TM. So, and the uniqueness of this is that we can do it on irradiated material, and that's not, not done uh, everywhere. So irradiated fuels is uh, not easy to do it everywhere. Okay, so with the, this was the last slide concerning the uh, introduction to the JLC and to Europe. Now, uh, a couple of slides uh, on the transmutation in the nuclear fuel cycle. And, uh, well, I guess that uh, some of you, you know very well when we talk about transmutation what we talk about, but uh, I thought to bring here again uh, uh, composition of spent nuclear fuel in order to see what are the issues uh, that uh, makes the spent nuclear fuel handling or management uh, uh, quite, uh, let's say, uh, a topic of discussion for the society and sometimes for politics. So when the nuclear fuel is discharged from a reactor, we have uh, most of the fuel is made out of uranium. You see here 95.5. It's a low, uh, um, a low, a low, uh, burn, burn fuel, so we have uh, 33 gigawatt uh, uh, per ton, but uh, I would say it's not changing that much if we go to higher uh, values. Uh, and then the remaining is what are called, uh, what are the so-called fission products, and uh, the fission products uh, are composed of 1% uh, is uh, plutonium, then we have the minor actinides, mainly neptunium, americium, and curium, 0.1%. The long-lived fission products also an issue, and also here 0.1%. And uh, then the short-lived fission products and the stable isotopes are not that much an issue. So the issue are the minor actinides in terms of uh, radiotoxicity at ingestion. And uh, the long-lived uh, fission products, uh, also here in terms of uh, radiotoxicity, but also very much uh, relevant in terms of dose rate. When the, the spent fuel is in, in inside the geological repository, one looks on mobility of the different isotopes, and when we look on that, 
we see that normally the minor actinides together with the plutonium are less mobile. So one tends to say uh, they show less problems, but the long-lived pr uh, fission products are very much more mobile and one has uh, we normally the uh, safety barrier of a geological repository are engineered in order to avoid uh, uh, or in order to keep this uh, isotopes under control. However, for what concerns transmutation, at the beginning the focus was uh, on the plutonium plus the minor actinide and the long-lived fission products. Uh, with time, the long-lived fission products, we have lost them. I will tell you why in a while. Uh, and we remain with the focus on the minor actinides, including the plutonium. And I have to say that uh, with time, again, we are losing some additional uh, isotope. We don't look on it anymore, or not anymore that much, which is the curium. Now, why this problem? Why are we losing this? There are a lot of, uh, of explanations. I give you my, ex my explanation. It is very difficult to produce targets or fuels or something with the fission products and then try to irradiate them, bombard them in order to uh, get rid of this uh, uh, long-term uh, radiotoxicity. For what concerns the curium, curium is a neutral emitter and you let you imagine how difficult it is to handle or to manage a material uh, that emits neutron. We can do this in my place or where I'm coming from in Karlsruhe. We can uh, handle, but we can handle only small quantities. And uh, I've shown you the actinide, minor actinide laboratory. These are hot cells with thick walls, uh, thick lead walls. And uh, so it is, uh, it is an issue in terms of uh, technology, in terms of uh, fa fabricability of the fuel. But OK, we remain still with the point and uh, the study on transportation has been done. And uh, well, yes, uh, maybe just to say what uh, happens with the spent. Well, nowadays, what happens with the spent fuel is this. We store it. Uh, uh, there are different type of uh, approaches. It's uh, dry, it's wet storage, close to the reactor, or some, somehow central. But this is uh, nowadays the uh, option. For the future, there are different options under consideration. One is the direct, direct disposal in a geological uh, repository. Another option is the long-term storage. This is, for instance, in the Netherlands. They built uh, such a facility and they put there the spent fuel for 100 years and afterwards, uh, the generations uh, afterwards will decide what to do. And then uh, there is the recycling together with the partitioning and transmutation. Uh, as an option. And then you see here the partitioning and transmutation looks on different, uh, 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 on different uh, variants that one can consider. Um, and now I guess I have the, yeah. I'm sorry because I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward for, yeah. So the different variants, I have it here. I'm, I'm sorry, I will go back afterwards. Uh, yeah, there are different strategies that one can consider on how to uh, take out the plutonium and the minor actinide of the spent fuel and how to treat it. And here I put in this table the different strategies. So you see one can separate the plutonium and uh, in order to have stock reduction only of the plutonium and the minor actinide, one can think if uh, one burn it or one put it in as high level waste, whatever. Uh, then there is also the use of plutonium in a fast reactor for the long term, so the so-called uh, homogeneous uh, recycling. And in this case, in the moment that I recycle, I separate plutonium plus the minor actinides, and I put everything back in a fast reactor and try to burn and I try to come to equilibrium. Uh, then there is the option to uh, reduce the stock of minor actinide in dedicated burn burners and to use uh, uh, or to only partially reduce the stock of plutonium because of the plutonium can be recycled in the fast reactor. And in this case, what is necessary is you immediately understand the chemical process is different because we have to separate the plutonium from the minor actinide. And uh, at the end, we have also the uh, reduction of the transuranic stock, so meaning plutonium plus minor actinide 
in dedicated burners and here uh, conversion ratio one, uh, less than one can be even a fast reactor that can um, can be designed. The core of the fast reactor can be designed in such a way that it burns uh, everything. So these are the, the options that one can consider. However, for all for all these options, uh, there is the need of R and D. Uh, and you see, I've uh, highlighted in red this part because I will talk only about. Uh, uh, well, talk. I will just give you an idea about uh, fuel, uh, the transmuta uh, no, transmutation fuel fabrication. But uh, uh, what is also relevant is that you need a transmutation system. There are different systems under investigation. So there's the fast reactor, the idea to use molten salt reactor. What we have done a lot in Europe was the ADS, this is an accelerator driven system, and here is a scheme which is a quite interesting because it's a complex system. You have a, a proton accelerator. The proton accelerator is directed inside the core of the, of the reactor. Inside, but uh, on a spallation target, then the protons hits the target. Through spallation reac uh, reaction, uh, neutrons are generated, and the neutrons sustain the chain reactor inside the core of the ADS, which is a subcritical core. So it's uh, and uh, well, the idea comes. Uh, the original idea is very, very old. But uh, then we had Carlo Rubia, our Nobel Prize in physics, uh, that came back with the idea and say, why, why we don't do it like that? And we can even when we switch off the accelerator, we switch off the reactor. It was not exactly like that, but uh, quite close. And uh, then we have the partitioning of uh, the actinides. So the other R&D area, very important, is the chemistry. So how we can separate uh, uh, the, uh, the minor actinides or the actinides from the spent fuel in a, an effective way, because all what remains would go then to the geological repository. So the less it remains, the better it is in terms of uh, higher level waste. Um, yeah, maybe some, uh, some considerations on design objectives of uh, these reactors and uh, again in uh, Europe we were looking, or at least when I was working on that, uh, we were looking very much on the ADS system and you see that when, when uh, a designer comes and says I want to design a reactor, the designer looks on very specific issues uh, which are of course the safe operation in all conditions and the cost. And uh, one can translate these issues in terms of uh, what does it mean for those that are going to build the reactor. So mean, this means that one should have, uh, for the safe operation, reliable components for the cost, for instance, uh, minimum capital cost. And then you immediately connect this to the material, the type of material that is used to build the reactor. So the cost of, uh, of the steel for the reactor vessel, for instance, can be a, a point. Uh, then one looks also on sustainability, so the breathing ratio or the doubling time. That's a very important point uh, when, uh, uh, when we look on uh, countries that say, I want to use uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear energy for a long time and I don't want to have too much the problem of uh, the resources that would be the uranium available, I could think to breed and to recycle the plutonium and then I would uh, reduce the issue of uh, resources. Uh, and what does it mean? And it is then translated in the design of the reactor core, so high neutron energy, high breathing gain, and low fissile specific inventory so that you, you have to have a good neutron economy inside the core. For what concerns the transmutation, it is the other way around. So here the high transmutation rate means that one needs a, a hard um, a spectrum in terms of uh, energy. So the harder the spectrum, the better it is and uh, the more I can transmute or efficient uh, the actinides uh, in this uh, uh, minor actinides fuel. Uh, yeah, this was the design of the reactor, so more generic, then you go down and you look on the requirement of the design of the fuel pin, so the things are coming now more stringent, 
and uh, what uh, are the design margins uh, or the parameters that affect design margins are here proposed. Uh, first of all, the materials properties. It's very important that you know what are the properties of the material that you're going to choose when you think you want to design uh, an innovative system. Then, uh, and uh, the burn up. This is, uh, uh, you see, it's quite, oh, no, I, I've not put the, the here. So this is coming uh, from a, a book that was uh, written here in the USA. It's quite old, but it's had, it has not changed for what concerns the uh, solid fuel. So what are normally the phenomena that occurs in a fuel uh, pin that is irradiated inside the reactor? And we look from the inside to the outside. So first of all, the fuel material, you can have fuel creep, uh, differential thermal expansion, the fuel cracking, the production and the eventually release of the fission gas, the restructuring of the fuel. So there are some uh, areas, uh, for instance, at the rim that uh, have a different, completely different appearance after irradiation with respect to what uh, uh, happens in the core of the fuel. Uh, the gap conductance uh, uh, that can change during the irradiation impacting the uh, thermal uh, diffusivity and then of course uh, linear power and temperature are the parameters that impact the fuel and cladding performance. In the outside we have the cladding, so this is the first barrier of the, of the reactor if uh, one can say it like that. And also on the cladding, there are a number of uh, phenomena occurring on the material itself. You see here the yield strengths, irradiation damage, embrittlement and swelling, and creep. And creep is not only the thermal creep that uh, you might know, but there is also the irradiation creep to be uh, considered very much. Now to, to go and focus again a little bit more, I could talk about 100 types of fuels, but I've uh, chosen a very strange one because it's the inert matrix fuel for the ADS. And uh, the inert matrix fuel uh, is a fuel where the matrix is not uranium. It's something that uh, uh, has to be uh, a material that is not uh, involved in the fission reactor. Uh, reaction or in the neutron economy inside the reactor should not uh, produce any uh, isotope that increases the radiotoxicity that I want to decrease. So this was the uh, this is the uh, the criteria in order to choose this type of fuel for the ADS. And uh, the there have been different uh, inert matrix fuels that have been uh, selected, but. They show almost all some uh, common uh, uh, type of problems. And one problem I've uh, brought it here. And this is, uh, you see, this is uh, the inert matrix here was uh, a mixed oxide, magnesium and aluminum oxide. And the part that uh, was, uh, let's say, uh, irradiated is the americium oxide. Um, Normally, when uh, we fabricate this uh, type of uh, uh, material, there is some porosity occurring in, in the material. And this is the black dots that you see here. Plus, there are the white dot is the americium oxide, and then the gray part is the inert matrix. And uh, after irradiation, you see that the porosity increases quite a lot and changes also depending from the position where uh, one looks at. And this increase of porosity uh, has also as consequence the increase of, um, of um, the dimension which we call swelling. So it starts to increase in dimension and you can imagine that this is something unwished inside a reactor. Uh, and uh, after doing the, all the analysis it was clear that uh, the swelling is uh, due to the fact that uh, while irradiated, the americium produces helium, and the helium is trapped partially, partially inside the this pores, and partially it is uh, trapped inside the matrix. And uh, we had uh, the, the, there was a lot of uh, experiments done in order to prefer this type of uh, fuel, in order to irradiate, in order to do the PA, and to understand how the helium was uh, behaving and how the swelling was behaving in order to find some uh, mitigation uh, 
uh, effects. Here it is just to show you, I, I told you that in partially the helium is trapped here in the holes and in part is, it is also in the matrix and there were also some investigation done and this was done in Karlsruhe uh, in, uh, in my institute where uh, it was shown that the helium is, is also trapped in the matrix which is uh, during the irradiation it becomes amorphous and if one heats it heat the matrix up, it can, uh, it occurs a recrystallization and thanks to the recrystallization the helium is released and this is shown here, so you see here that's the amorphous matrix then here it's recrystallizing and at 1600 K it is already crystalline and uh, with the CAMS we measure the helium release and you see it corresponds with the maximum, so with the peak release uh, of helium uh, so, given these uh, findings, there was, uh, of course, immediately the idea to find a solution in order to have the helium released during the irradiation, in order to avoid the trapping. And the solutions are twofold. On the one hand, uh, one was saying, okay, we can have, uh, we can work on the microstructure of the inert matrix in order to have open pores, and during the irradiation, the helium diffuses and goes in the upper fission gas plenum. And the other was, during the irradiation, we have to be able to increase the temperature. And to increase the temperature, an option is to add plutonium uh, to the inert matrix. So this has been done. The new options have been irradiated. You see here, there is now the plutonium with the americium. The inert matrix is slightly different, but this is, again, not, uh, not really, really the issue. They are irradiated and now waiting for the post-irradiation examination in order to see if these two things that have been uh, considered are effective in uh, reducing the swelling. <coughs> now, the other point in a pin element is also the cladding material. Also here, I will go uh, quickly through the different options that are viable for the cladding material, I want to recall that the cladding material is the first barrier and has to contain uh, the fuel and the fission gas uh, during the irradiation. Now for a cladding material, the options considered in the very past uh, when we had the fast reactors in Europe, we were looking on austenitic steels. Um, there have been, uh, for instance, here in the US also looking on ferritic or ferritic martensitic steels and uh, for good reasons because uh, the option in terms of fuel was uh, metallic fuel instead of uh, oxide fuel. Um, there are some uh, issues with the ferritic martensitic steels because they have quite low hoop stress, but in order to increase the hoop stress, the variance is to look on ODS ferritic or ferritic martensitic steels, and then another variant that is considered is the sig sig. Um, and uh, here I have uh, quite, a, how can I say, a depressing, uh, <laughs> if I can say it like that, slide because I show only what are the problems on the materials. But this is uh, just to tell you, okay, we can select the <coughs> material, we always find a problem and then either we change the material, we make it better or we design around the material in order to address the problem. So here the austenitic steel is the swelling, here is the hoop stress, here is the different impact properties uh, of the ODS in the, in the two directions. So even if this is something that we know more or less also from the zircaloid, and in case of six sig is the drop uh, of thermal conductivity with irradiation. So here every, all, all these materials have problems. Now this is good. Uh, maybe just to enter for the austenitic steel is the swelling. I told you before, so it's uh, similar to the fuel. It also this increases in uh, this material increases in um, dimension, and in this case, it's the nickel doing the problem because the nickel, while irradiated, creates helium. Helium is trapped, and then it starts to increase in uh, in uh, dimension. And uh, the other point is uh, that. Uh, it has two problems. The second problem is while it is increasing in dimension, so while it is swelling, it starts to be brittle. So it starts to, be, to behave in a way that is not wanted when the material is inside the reactor. So here you see uh, there have been, also here it's a lot of uh, irradiation experiments done 
and luckily not that much in terms of modeling. It's not that easy to model uh, oscillatic steel. So in terms of experiments, it has been shown that uh, when, you, when the material reaches about 5% swelling, there is a drop of the total elongation. This is the ability of the material to deform in order to uh, be able to withstand thermal or mechanical stresses. And the other point, uh, at least back to the origin that I said uh, to you that we were working on ADS system. This ADS system had as coolant uh, uh, the so-called heavy liquid metals. So these were either liquid lead or liquid uh, lead bismuth. And uh, this liquid metal are very, very corrosive. Uh, again, a problem. Uh, but uh, okay, one should know the problem in order to see how to address the issue. We have seen that it is very corrosive both in the ferritic martensitic steel and in the oscillatic steel. The type of corrosion mechanism that have been observed were uh, the oxidation, but also the steel element dissolution. So there was a penetration of the liquid metal inside the steel matrix, creating uh, not, uh, and I will show you in the next slide what type of problems uh, this, uh, this phenomenon here creates. And uh, it has been observed on uh, both the ferritic martensitic and the oscillatic steel. And what we have tried to do was uh, to identify temperature windows where the material could be used and under which conditions it could be used. And one condition is uh, controlling the oxygen inside the liquid metal in order to let an oxide scale increase on the surface of the steel uh, by having it not too thick, so controlling also the thickness of the oxide scale. Uh, and as I told you before, what happens when the liquid metal penetrates inside the steel, so the oxide scale maybe is not there or it, uh, it's broken, then there is a complete degradation of the mechanical properties. You see it here, there's some tensile test results. Here's again the uniform elongation that goes uh, uh, down. This is the ferritic martensitic steel. Or here you see that uh, the, if you have a crack on the material and you put the crack under tension in the liquid metal, the crack starts to grow and it grows much faster if it is in the liquid metal. So it, the liquid metal helps it much more with respect to air, and this are, it's the same, so there are some low cycle fatigue tests, so the resistance of cycling, thermal cycling or mechanical cycling is uh, reduced in the liquid metal. So again, problems, and uh, either one changes the steel, one tries to change the composition of the steel, or one uh, designs the reactor around this type of problems. Mm -hmm. And this, were, this is more recent, it's 2016 results. So these are quite interesting results because we've seen that this ferritic martensitic steel has problems under irradiation, has problems uh, in the liquid metal, but the two are synergistic. So in the moment that it's irradiated with liquid metal, uh, the behavior of the material drops really, the mechanical behavior of the material drops really a lot. So again, it's a question if this type of material is really to be used uh, for the heavy liquid metal question to be answered. Uh, well, I've shown, I, I went quite quickly through the two areas, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry, it was too quick maybe, to the two different areas, the fuel and the material. In both areas, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, we need to do uh, always irradiation experiments in order to understand how the two material behaves under irradiation. This is the most important things, thing for all safety consideration of the nuclear reactors. Uh, now, the irradiation experiments have been done, and for this type of approach, we need few, uh, sorry, we need a fast neutron spectrum. So, the irradiation experiments have been done in the past in fast neutron spectrum reactors like, for instance, the Phoenix reactor. And uh, nowadays, uh, we, are, we have not that much uh, uh, fast neutron spectrum reactor anymore. What is viable is, for instance, uh, the Bor 60 in Russia, and, uh, and that's it. So for the future, I guess the, what is now under consideration in the different world regions is to build new fast spectrum reactors. So here in the US, I guess it's uh, quite recent also the announcement uh, 
uh, that uh, there is a financing now, a substantial financing to uh, design the versatile test reactor and combined with the feed uh, uh, reactor, I guess it's a good combination to see on the one hand the irradiation <coughs> of uh, the fuel in the material in normal conditions and with street to see also how the material behaves in uh, transient conditions. Uh, other options are the NBR in Russia or the Julogovitz in uh, Europe. It's, this is not really a fast spectrum reactor, but they have uh, the design for sees uh, some areas uh, where the uh, spectrum, where the, there is a fast spectrum area and the mirror reactor in, uh, in Belgium. And this here is the um, it's the so-called uh, accelerator-driven system, but in terms of test reactor. And, of course, one uh, needs not only the irradiation facilities, but also the associated laboratories. Okay, now the last point, and uh, I'm, I'm going fast because I want you to have also some questions for me, and uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry, so Whatever questions, I will be very happy to go back to the slides and discuss uh, them with you. So the last point is, uh, um, I told you before at the beginning uh, uh, that we did also an interesting study in order to understand how society sees uh, the partitioning and transmutation of nuclear fuels and this compared to the direct disposal in a geological repository. And we did this study in Germany. So it was quite a special, uh, it's quite a special country because Germany has decided to phase out and going back and saying to the Germans, well, we want now to do P and T here in Germany needed to be understand, understood better. And we did the study, it was a group of nuclear engineers uh, and material scientists together with a group of social scientists and uh, putting together these groups was already quite interesting because we had to define common scenarios and common cr criteria to evaluate these scenarios. And the scenarios that we have uh, chosen were uh, the three that are here, maybe I go from the bottom and go up to the top. So the uh, last, the, well, the first scenario that I want to discuss is this partitioning transmutation of uh, transuranic elements to be done in Germany. So meaning we build everything in Germany, we do it only with the waste that we have produced in Germany, and then we have, when we have finished, we, we decommission these facilities. Then there was uh, the option to look at um, the PNT facilities as regional facilities, not only in Germany, but in Europe. So we maybe have uh, ADS or ADS Park, I have to say, that we share with the other European countries, uh, similarly for the partitioning uh, uh, or the chemical industry that you need to do the partitioning, and similar, similarly for the uh, fuel uh, fabrication for the transmutation fuel fabrication, and then the other, the last scenario or uh, was okay. We do we don't do anything, but we do the R and D. So we continue R and D in the field of PNT, but we don't decide today and we delay the decision if building uh, PNT systems. Now these three scenarios were measured against. Uh, a scenario that we call reference scenario, we don't do anything. No R&D, no, so we, we forget about this option. This was our reference scenario. And uh, for the three, we were investigating uh, societal aspects, economics and environmental aspects. And to make a long story short, you, I let you imagine what was the outcome. It's clear, no? That, that this scenario was absolutely not acceptable. Then uh, the intermediate scenario started to be okay, could be interesting because of uh, the good uh, help, for instance, in terms of societal aspects, help weak regions. You could bring uh, work, money, whatever, in a region in Europe that was, could be considered weak as a positive aspect. Uh, and another positive aspect when one looks on the economics, there is shared cost, so why not? We share the cost, it's not uh, done by only by one country. 
uh, and then another uh, well another the environmental aspect was uh, I have to say here not that much positive things considered and the scenario that uh, had the let's say the more more positive uh, feedback was uh, okay we do R and D but you see also here the trend is not completely positive so there was uh, still the idea well is it really needed that we have to do R and D should we spend our money in the R and D uh, for P and T we could uh, spend it for something different um, so these were the the, the the other point. So at the end, we, we did the study, we concluded, and the conclusion was, of course, yes, we can do, we can imagine to continue to do R&D activities on partitioning and transmutation in the country Germany. It was quite interesting to see how uh, one uh, has uh, feedback uh, from uh, society through social scientists. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, I don't uh, go through, this is, was uh, again, it's the conclusion of the table that I told you before. And now my last slide. So I was, uh, I, when I came here, I was thinking to come here, I was thinking to tell you a lot of things. Uh, but of course, if one wants to say a lot, at the end you say nothing, I know. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, perfect uh, aware of, the, of that. but. Uh, as uh, Kenko said, uh, imperfect uh, sets are better than nothing. So I hope you enjoyed and thank you for your attention. And in our R&D activity, but at present we are not uh, doing this approach. I, in Europe I can say yes, because uh, there are, uh, in France there is an idea to see how one can use AI in order to, to feed the data that are viable into a model and then understand uh, how Either the material behaves without irradiation experiments, which are long and expensive, or even to develop new materials. But we are not doing that. Not I have a less technical question. One is you had a budget of 365 million euros. Mm -hmm. Is that all for nuclear? No, 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 no. This is the budget for all GFC. So what fraction is nuclear? Uh, nuclear is uh, in the order of 25% of this budget. Okay, so the second question is, you're talking about nuclear security. Are you all focused on SNM or you're also worried about the security aspects of radionuclides that are used in the industry? Ah, good question. Uh, well, I, I'm not so that much inside the security aspect, but uh, um, I would say that in terms of safeguards, we look uh, mainly on SNM, uh, but we do also depart on uh, uh, illicit trafficking, and there we get, let's say, requests from uh, an harbor or something like that to check, and uh, when we check this, or to see how to check the situation when we do that, we don't care if it's coming from a nuclear industry or from other industries. So cobalt sources, for instance, could be something that we look when we look on specific issues. Thank you. Last quick question before we have to go. I think there's a lot something. You said that in order to uh, heat up the um, uh, the trans uh, the actinides uh, <coughs> and to reduce. Uh, or to increase helium diffusion, you wanted to 
add some plutonium to, uh, to make. Do they have a higher yeah. temperature during irradiation? But plutonium is where the minor actinides come from. So there are other fissile, uh, uh, fissile nuclides that you could use that don't produce minor actinides like uh, U-233 or, uh, you know, let's put in some thorium and make you. Yes, uranium-233. That's a long way from the minor actinides. We should produce it first to, to, to use it. Yeah? We, we, get it, we need it first, and then we can use it uh, like that. Uh, but uh, the, the, the point is clear. The point is clear. But uh, the, in the moment that the plutonium is in, you can first redesign the core in order that you avoid to have an increase of the minor actinide you, that you don't want. Oh. Yeah? Th this is something that can be done, and there have been done a lot of calculations in order to, to have also the quantity of plutonium in order to have an effective reduction of the minor actinide. I know there is another question, but the process will start after this, so, so but Concetta will be around. I'm around, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.